This is Dimitri Spinrad. And this is Isaac Meyer. And you're listening to Criminal Records Podcast, a podcast about some of the weirdest cases in true crime history. And today, we are picking up a subject that I talked about in the tail end of a previous episode about the Bloody Code. So just a reminder, the Bloody Code was Britain's particularly notorious era of laws that made capital punishment a possible sentence for a massive number of crimes, some of them very minor, a chunk of them things that we would not even consider crimes today. And at the end of that, we talked about the rollback of the Bloody Code, and specifically, we talked about a wave of reform in the early 1800s that led to those laws getting gradually changed so that far fewer criminals were getting hanged for things like property crimes. So we also did mention that although the Bloody Code was harsh, there were a lot more chances to get out of a death sentence than you might expect under it. Judges, juries, and even prosecutors were exercising a whole lot of discretion to keep people off the scaffold, especially as we got into the 1800s and public sentiment really started turning against the harshness of death sentences. Of the people who were sentenced to death under these laws, only about half ended up on the gallows in some periods. Uh, Some periods way, way less than half, as few as one in ten in some circumstances. Some were being pardoned, but some others got other punishments, like corporal punishment or transportation to penal colonies overseas. In 1832, the Reform Act changes the British electoral system, and it opens up some opportunities for independent MPs to get into Parliament and to start reforming these harsh laws into something more humane and modern. These are the refor- the like electoral reforms where you can't just like have your own little weird borough that you inherited from 500 years ago that two people live in and you've bribed both of them to vote for you like those reforms yes these are those reforms and they also mean that all of a sudden politicians are subject to you know some the popular vote acting on them yes the popular vote basically it means that uh Having this sort of um, sham legal system on top of your real one where you say that you're you're going to dole out these incredible, incredibly harsh punishments and then in practice you come up with a bunch of reasons why those punishments won't be applying because they are so ridiculously harsh. It just couldn't be a functional system if you followed the law as it was written. It turns out the public actually doesn't love that so much. And as politicians who are suddenly having to campaign for the public, uh, you know, you got to start changing things really fast. Uh, yeah. And I'll, always when you let people start voting, just, you know, the good old boys club just stops being what it used to be. So, yeah, in, in one sense, this as this good old boys club is opening up, they're saying, you know, it's time to have a more humane, more modern Britain. We need a better system of laws because we are, I mean, we've conquered a huge chunk of the world at this point, so we should spread the enlightenment of British law around the world. On the other hand, however, um, the bloody code is kind of starting to be an embarrassment within Britain because, like I said, the difference between how the law is written and how it's followed is becoming public knowledge and it's getting incredibly embarrassing. So some of this reform is coming from a genuine attempt to make things more humane, Some of this reform is coming from an understanding that the public is not taking the law very seriously because it is clearly not being practiced. So reformers are starting to roll back a lot of these laws, which means that criminals who had previously been sentenced to death would now be sentenced to other things instead. So now you have this whole new population of criminals who are you are not killing for crimes like destroying fish ponds, minor theft, being malicious seven-year-olds, you have to find something to do with your criminal population. We've gotten soft on the kids these days. And there are a lot of kids these days. More kids these days than ever before in Britain. Britain is going through a massive population boom in the 1800s because this is the Industrial Revolution. There is just flat out more of everybody in Britain. So even if only a small percentage of your population is committing crimes... That means there are a whole lot more criminals cycling through your justice system because there are more people. And around the same time that all of this is happening, 
Britain is losing access to the really convenient thing it used to do with large numbers of criminals who weren't put to death, penal transportation, aka shipping all your prisoners overseas. See, in the 1700s, Britain was this huge, rich colonial power. It was kind of its thing. And to stay a super rich colonial power, it definitely helps if you have a big labor force of people who will work in your colonies without pesky things like wages. So chattel slavery is one convenient source of free labor, and it is one that Britain most definitely took advantage of with the transatlantic slave trade. But it was not the only source of free labor that Britain had available. Because if you've got a bunch of overcrowded cities and underpopulated colonies, at least underpopulated with the white people that you would like to fill them with, Another way to balance out your population is to transport your convicted criminals from your overpopulated cities and have them work in penal colonies or even put them on sale so that businessmen could buy them for the period of their conviction. It's not technically chattel slavery in the way that we in the U.S. talk about slavery, but it is, uh, let's say, a type of forced labor that is very slavery adjacent. It's still fairly problematic, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, I would say, um, you know what, let's put a pin in this particular question of penal labor, because we are coming back to that later in the episode. So the people who are already living in British colonies are not necessarily thrilled about their homes becoming dumping grounds for convicts or their own wages potentially being undercut by the supply of extremely cheap and free labor. Unless, of course, they're the ones who are rich enough to be buying these convicts to work on their very large plantations. As early as the 1690s, people who were already living in America were trying to turn away British convict ships from American ports. Britain responded by passing the Transportation Act of 1718, basically standardizing the transportation system and saying America's got to accept these people. Over 50,000 British convicts were sent to America in the 1700s, but uh, that convenient way of getting rid of criminals ends in 1775 when violent conflict kicks off between Britain and America and Americans start turning convict ships away again. But just because the route to America is cut off means that the Transportation Act is no longer in effect. So Britain starts shipping convicts off to Australia instead. Over 160,000 convicts from the empire end up in New South Wales and Van Diemen's land during the late 1700s and the early to mid 1800s. Some even get sent to Bermuda and Gibraltar, which aren't technically penal colonies, but do have a need for laborers. And people have been making jokes at Australia's expense ever since. Yes, uh, some of some of why Australia gets so many more convicts by numbers than America does is, again, just because Britain's population has hugely expanded due to the Industrial Revolution. So there's just more people at the time that people are getting shipped off. But as we talked about in, in uh, the last episode on the Bloody Code, the longer this set of laws goes on, um, the more lenient people, especially uh, juries and magistrates who have a lot of ability to grant more lenient sentences under the system, the more they get kind of weird feeling about the number of people who are being sentenced to death and they, uh, they send a lot of them away um, in penal transportation instead. So it, just a huge, a, more and more people exist under this system and more, more of those criminals who are being made under that system are being trans transported. And then of course, because the industrial revolution completely shakes up uh, the, the economy of Britain and causes a lot of jobs involving skilled labor to disappear. There are also more people who are turning to crime out of desperate circumstances and thus are getting fed into this transportation system. So transportation to Australia does work for a while, but Australians eventually do start refusing to take in any more convicts. And of course, even under a system where uh, penal transportation is an option, there are a lot of people who are committing smaller crimes that don't meet the threshold for transportation. So 
what are you going to do with all of these criminals if you can't hang them and you can't ship them overseas? Corporal punishment would be an option were it not for those pesky reformers who had decided it's inhumane to cut people's bits off or publicly flog them or pillory them. You need to come up with some better me method of punishment than that. Uh, the woke agenda is always canceling things, like chopping hands off publicly. It is so woke not to castrate your dear thieves. So to punish your criminals, you're going to put them in prison. England did have prisons before the 19th century. Uh, they're small. They're not that well run. Some of them are uh, what are called hulks, these like floating, uh, really decrepit ships that are just being turned into prison barges. Uh, even the ones that are actual buildings and not half decayed ships are not pleasant places to be. They are really, really nasty places. The biggest and most notorious of the English prisons uh, built before the 1800s is Newgate. It was commissioned all the way back in the 1300s by King Henry II, and it houses about 300 felons and debtors. So let me tell you some gross facts about Newgate uh, from people who had been there. There were so many lice and bed bugs that as you walked around the prison, you could actually hear dead bugs crunching under your shoes all the time. No, I don't like this. Don't like this at all. Oh, no, it gets grosser. It stank incredibly badly. Uh, it was loud all of the time because conditions were so overcrowded. There was just a huge number of stinky, lice-infested people who were just packed into one room. Uh, some of those people were what we today would say were very mentally ill. Um, so they were attacking fellow prisoners. They were yelling at all hours of the day and night. Um, some of them were kept in chains all the time. Uh, putting people in irons within the prison itself was kind of another form of punishment. And... In addition to all of these prisoners who are all mixed up together, debtors are mixed in with murderers, are uh, all mixed in together. There are children there because female prisoners were imprisoned with their children. So there are kids growing up in this. You know, I think I'd just take Australia, honestly. Yeah. And just to, uh, just to show you how much better Australia was than the alternative... Uh, after a rebuild in 1782, London's public gallows were moved from Tyburn to right outside Newgate. So prisoners who were condemned to death could not only hear the crowds jeering at other prisoners who were dying right outside, because, of course, this is still the period where executing people is considered public entertainment, but they also get treated to a special chant about how they're going to hell and a bell that rings at midnight right before executions. A guy actually goes around chanting about how they're going to hell the night before an execution happens. I thought that, wait, I thought that was the whole thing about giving people the last rites so they didn't go to hell. I'm confused by the theology here. What, what he's doing, the chant is specifically about how they're going to go to hell if they don't repent. Okay. Yeah, so it's to scare them so much that they do repent. I see. Okay. I was confused by the theology here for a second, but mm -hmm. now it all is make sense the word. Now it all fits together. <laughs> Put a pin in theology too, because we are going to get back to that. Um, and this is Newgate. And Newgate actually at least makes some attempt to uh, do some things that are considered more modern by prison standards, like separating prisoners by which I mean men and women do get held in separate areas. And uh, of course, people who can pay for better accommodations at Newgate get separated out from the riffraff. So you can enjoy your lice and bed bugs in more privacy. Other prisons like Colbath Fields don't even separate out men and women, adults and children. Uh, really serious criminals tend to get mixed in, to petty in, in with the petty offenders. And, uh, of course, prisons like this, there's a physical limit on, even as overcrowded as they are, how many more people you can cram into them. The justice system is condemning more and more people who can't be transported and can't be hanged. More and more prisoners keep being 
crammed into these prisons and it's it's just not physically possible to fit more people into them past a certain point. Uh, the prison system is clearly starting to break down and it is time for England to rethink its prison system. So this starts in the 1700s, uh, the late 1700s, but it continues on into the 1800s. And this rethinking of how they're going to build and maintain their prison system is going on during an era that's seeing a real flowering of public interest in making human society more humane and more efficient on every possible level. And uh, I'm going to admit, we've talked about this era of social reform on this podcast before, and we have not been particularly kind to it as a concept. Uh, some of the ideas that come out of this era, like the temperance movement, the whole white slavery panic, and some of those reform ideas lead to some passing of some incredibly poorly advised laws. But some good things also do come out of this era of progressive thought in the 1800s, uh, like abolishing slavery in Britain and eventually in America, establishing some protections for workers, uh, the suffrage movement. Some good things do come out of this era of reform. And most importantly, for the topic of this episode, as reformers are tackling the justice system, they aren't just looking at the law as it's written. They're, they're looking at more than rolling back capital punishments. They are looking at prison reform. Am I remembering right that we're this means we're going to have to talk about some of my least favorite philosophers? <laughs> We okay. I I only actually talk about one philosopher. And Is it one Jeremy Bentham? In this, of course, it's Jeremy Bentham. Oh my god. Okay. Spo okay. Spoiler alert. Jeremy Jeremy Bentham is not going to be happy with the way this plays out. I can live with that then. <laughs> so let's think about the way people are talking about criminals as a group during this time period. You are seeing the start of what becomes a very popular strain of criminology, that a criminal nature is something that is inherent to a person, maybe even a physical trait that you can measure and calculate in the dimensions of the skull. These are the people who want to use prisons to warehouse these uh, what they call born criminals, keeping them out of the way of society so that society can be clean and safe without the criminal element in it. So we're a little bit pre-eugenics here as a pseudoscientific fad, but it, the logic that will come to define eugenics is very much brewing in this strain of thought. Well, fortunately, as we all know, phrenology is a very legitimate science, which is why you still see people buying phrenology skulls at like TJ Maxx all the time. Oh, you don't like my decorative eugenics ob yeah. object? I never art? got that. Like, okay, the whole TJ Maxx aesthetic. I I see what the how it all fits together, and then you just occasionally have the like phrenology skulls. I'm like, do you know what those are? Um, I okay, I understand as as objects of art, and during a time period where like sort of neo Victorian stuff was kind of popular, I I see how those got popular. Um, but also. Some of the history underpinning underpinning that is a little grim, and I'm sure this is not the last time we're going to talk about phrenology on this podcast because it it gets involved in criminology, specifically in these attempts to identify something that is inborn about like a criminal nature. Like, oh, if we can just measure everyone's skulls, then we know who the baddies are. Yeah, if you're not familiar with this notion, it's the idea. Let's see if I'm getting this right or remembering this correctly. That certain parts of the brain like are like muscles essentially and they grow physically the more you use them and so you can measure the skulls of bad people and find the parts of the brain that are swollen and those are the bad parts and if anyone else has a skull shape similar to that that means they're bad too and uh it gets into not only just skull shape but facial features more generally and uh also into uh you know Commonly Jewish facial features, commonly Italian and Southern European. Oh yeah, I was going to say in the 19th century, there's no way that could go wrong. Yeah, uh, th for some reason they spend a lot of time trying to um, measure the facial features of Irish people to somehow argue that they're less evolved. It goes to some really oh, fucking. Weird I think places. I know why the Brit why the English want to do that. <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's yeah. Day, everyone. <laughs> 
So that is that is one strain of thought. And as you can tell from the way we're talking about it, it is a uh, it is not a strain of thought that we condone that the idea that you are just, you know, like when you are a baby, when you are born, you are already born with the elements of criminality inside you. So that's one strain of thought. The other strain of thought is coming from reformers who do believe that people people themselves can be reformed. They can be changed into better people. Just because someone who has committed a crime once doesn't mean that they have an inherent criminal nature and thus must remain a criminal forever. There is a way to make them a better member of society again. And a lot of these convicts are not getting life sentences. Sooner or later, they are going to have to go out and rejoin society again. So it does make a lot of sense that you're, you know, you're spending time thinking about when these people leave prison, what kind of people are they going to be? And then they start asking themselves, is there a way to make it so that people who are leaving prison after their, their prison sentences are leaving it as better people than they came into prison? Is it possible to design a prison in such a way that you morally reform the convicts who go through it and they leave as productive members of society. I don't leave me in suspense, is it? <laughs> well, let's find out. Let's talk about some of the ways that Britain specifically attempts to build a prison that reforms people. And this isn't a movement that is just happening in Britain. Uh, America has its own prison for reformers. A lot of other countries do as well. We're talking about Britain specifically because uh, we're coming off that Bloody Code episode and also because of the end of the Bloody Code and because of the lack of, uh, the, because of losing some of that access to penal transportation. Britain is under a particular crunch to build a lot of new prisons fast and to reform how things happen in the prisons that it already does have. So they they put a lot of their wackiest ideas into practice in a way that uh, America was given actually given some of their ideas and even had some of the the ideas sort of pushed uh, pushed in America and went no thank you this is actually too crazy for us but Britain Britain did all of this so let's start off with your favorite philosopher of all time, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I feel I feel a need now to stake out my position here and head off a bunch of angry emails. It's okay to like Jeremy Bentham. I find him a little annoying to read, but that's true of every 19th century philosopher. He's less of an annoying prick than Immanuel Kant, so he has that going for him. And I do think the thing about having his body stuffed and put up in University College London is very funny. Okay, now that you've gotten that out of out of the way. Yeah, uh, I am disappointed that you can't steal his head anymore, though, and do pranks with it. They replaced it with a fake head, apparently. Oh, I think it would do the greatest good for the greatest number of listeners if we if we explained what Jeremy Bentham was all about. I think the stuffed head thing is really all you need to know. <laughs> So apart from being a uh, cool waxwork these days, uh, Jeremy Bentham was the go-to guy for a field of ethical philosophy called utilitarianism. Bentham believes that the ultimate goal of ethics is to maximize the happiness and well-being of as many of people as possible, which is a goal that in theory I very much support. And uh, Bentham did have quite a lot of thoughts that I agree with about human society in general and specifically about how the justice system could maximize the well-being of people. He was against capital punishment and he was against physical punishment as well. He was against criminalizing acts like consensual sodomy that were only crimes because the law said so and not because anyone was actually being harmed in the process. But... When Bentham sat down to plan the ideal prison that would function as a place of reform without physical punishments, his ideas get a little wacky. Are we talking about the Panopticon? Yes, this is the Panopticon. So let's talk about the Panopticon, which is one of his most famous ideas. So this is the idea of a prison that is built in a circular shape. This entire building is going to be only one cell thick. 
And each cell is going to have an open side that faces the interior of the building. And in the middle of this circle is a tower. Uh, and the tower is an observation post that has one guard sitting in it. And the guard can see out of all sides of this tower. But the prisoners can't see the guard within the tower. So the guard can look into any of these cells at any time and see what the prisoners do are doing and the prisoners are going to live in this prison not knowing whether or not the guard is looking at them at any given moment. Bentham's idea is that people are going to be motivated to behave in the prison because they know that someone is watching out for misbehavior at all times. And he actually doesn't even think this idea should be limited to prisons. He thinks that this is a great design for schools and also hospitals. Wait, okay, schools I get. Why hospitals? I I didn't I didn't read his entire thing, so I'm not totally sure. I don't Having know if it's like them, a I don't blame you. Can, <laughs> I don't know if it's like a nurse who can check up on all patients all of the time or or what. Uh it I should also say the definition of hospital also in this era, era might have been a little broader. So there are some other reformatories that get called hospitals, but they're more sort of like a place for sex workers who don't want to be sex workers anymore, things like that. Those get called hospitals as well. Hmm. Okay. Well, honestly, I didn't I didn't know Jeremy Bentham had so many actually good ideas. I mostly know him from teaching ethics where, you know, utilitarianism is often introduced as a way to like troll um like intro students essentially because they're like oh the greatest good for the greatest number how easy and then you just go through everything that's like actually impossible about putting that into practice on a personal level um and then by the end of it they all become very cynical it, it's easy if you if you approach jeremy bentham from the perspective of the time period he was writing in and the criminal justice system that he was responding to it's actually a lot easier to like bentham because he did push back pretty hard against the state punishing people very harshly, um, especially for things that weren't really harming anyone in the first place. So in that sense, utilitarianism, big win for utilitarianism there, I, I think. Um, and I think uh, he, he talked a lot about sexual freedom, too. Um, there are things to like about Jeremy Bentham. But... Uh, he does have some stipulations for how this prison is going to work. He thinks actually the conduct of the prison guard, the one who is watching all these prisoners, is something that should in turn be watched by the public and also by authority figures in order to keep the guard honest. Uh, so this is really the philosophical core of his theory of the panopticon here. People are capable of self-discipline without the threat of physical punishment if they believe that they're being watched. This is an interesting idea, and it's a fun one to, to debate in philosophy class, but things go very badly when people attempt to literally build Jeremy Bentham's philosophy experiment. Yeah, I, I mean, I have know of instances where this was tried, most famously, like, I think Hong Kong had a Bentham-style jail at one point, um, I don't think it ended all crime in Hong Kong, but I don't know much about it beyond that. So uh, the first and most notorious, especially to fans of the Magnus Archives, if you listen to that podcast, is Millbank Prison. Uh, Bentham was actually directly involved in the early plans to buy the site that became Millbank Prison and to design the prison there. It was originally planned as a panopticon, but... Uh, it was built in an even weirder and less organized way by a series of architects who struggled to build this building because they were actually trying, the, the site that he chooses is actually a marsh and the building that they are trying to build keeps sinking into the marsh. Whoops. <laughs> so yeah, he actually disproves pretty heavily of how the plan had changed by, by the time that Millbank prison opens. And, uh, 
once Milbank Prison actually starts running, it doesn't put all of Bentham's plans for how prisoners should actually live into action. Because Bentham's idea of the prison is not just this abstract philosophical experiment. He actually has a lot of stipulations on how the prisoners should be treated while they're in prison. Uh, he thinks that they should be able to do things like bathe frequently. He thinks they should eat as much simple, nutritious food as they want. Uh, this is another big fad at the time, the idea of simple fare or giving people things without strong spices that will uh, corrupt their brain and body. Uh, so he does buy into that a little bit, but he's basically down with the idea of giving, pr giving prisoners healthy food. Um, so he believes that the it's not just the design of the prison itself that's going to keep people from bad behavior. It's the treatment, the humane treatment of prisoners within the prison. He does think that prisoners should be engaged in what he calls profitable labor, which he says will turn the whole operation into, quote, a mill grinding rogues honest and idle men industrious, end quote. Um, so it, it's not just that the Panopticon is supposed to be a vision of a prison where every prisoner could be under surveillance at any time. Uh, he believes that giving prisoners an, an unprecedented amount of choice in how they live while they're in prison, but also putting the surveillance on them will actually encourage them to make better choices and will eliminate some of the discipline issues of a prison. You don't have to punish the prisoners because they will, of their own free will, choose what is in their best interest. Does that make sense? It's a very utilitarian way of thinking about punishment, um, and I'm sure it worked perfectly. There's another angle to what Bentham is proposing here, which is a pretty radical idea at the time in Britain which is that he thinks instead of the state running the prison, a contractor should run the prison. And this is because every, he thinks that every time a prisoner dies in the panopticon, the contractor should be fined. The prison guard isn't just watching the prisoners to make the prisoners behave. The prison guard is responsible for the prisoners and the contractor running the prison is responsible for the prisoners. So you incentivize keeping the prisoners alive by finding the person running the prison if they die. So basically the economic incentive is to not be a shitty prison warden. Yes. So he is, he isn't just designing a prison that will make the prisoners behave. He is designing a prison that will make the prison system behave. Yeah. I mean, knowing what I know about the modern prison system, I'm start, I'm thinking maybe his ideas were not widely adopted. A lot, yeah, a lot of people miss that about the Panopticon. It's not just it's not just about surveillance of the prisoners. It's about a wider change in the way that that reward and punishment happens in the entire prison system. Unfortunately, Millbake Prison, like I said, was built on a marsh. Not only did the buildings keep sinking, but the prison draws water directly from the Thames, which means a ton of the prisoners in Millbank Prison die of typhoid and cholera, which are things that happen when one drinks directly from the Thames. And of course, that whole thing about giving prisoners nutritious food to eat does not happen. So a lot of these prisoners have scurvy and uh, other issues caused by lack of proper nutrition that hastens their death from these waterborne diseases. So Millbank Prison wild failure, does not do at all what Bentham was setting out to do. He actually spends the rest of his life incredibly bitter about the failure of Millbank Prison to be his ideal panopticon. Uh, there are even accounts of like, if people wrote about Millbank Prison at all in the papers, they would get a really angry letter from Jeremy Bentham about how like it wasn't really his vision. That wasn't what the panopticon was supposed to be. I mean, a great example, I suppose, of how it's very easy to have all these idealistic visions, but sometimes you just, you know, if you're a philosopher, you have to recognize that you're not all, you're not a project manager, and you're going to miss a few things if you try and run the, put this kind of thing together. Yeah, it turns out that philosophical thought experiments don't always transfer super well to the real world. Um, other attempts are made to build panopticon prisons. Uh and uh, like you said, in Hong Kong, um, for some reason, Cuba gets really into it for a while. Um, 
I think Fidel Castro was actually held in a prison for a while that was was modeled off the Panopticon. Um, And the Panopticon does lead to a style of prison building in Britain with a central hall and wings radiating radiating off it. So uh, while while Millbank was not the vision of the Panopticon, uh, the model prison Pentonville, uh, which we will get into in a bit for their other highly questionable practices, does have that sort of central area and then radiating wing style. That's the main actual practical contribution of the Panopticon as a concept to prison design. Um, but building a true Panopticon uh, is very difficult, even if you're not building it on a marsh. The structure tends to create a lot of problems with things like sound traveling through the prison. And of course, as Bentham found, the design of the structure alone is not going to fix larger issues with things like uh, neglectful prison administration, disease, poor nutrition, and other things that are impacting the prisoner's behavior and health. As far as I know, nobody has ever built and run a prison conforming exactly to Bentham's original plans, not only for its construction, but for its administration. Yeah, I mean, it's very idealistic um, and prob- probably on, like, you know, it's fun to clown on Jeremy Bentham as it is with so many of the insufferable white men of philosophy. But, you know, it certainly sounds a lot better than a lot of uh, my understanding of how the prison system works in much of the world even today. Um, how much you could get people to invest in making that vision a reality, I suppose, is a different question. I'll, I'll keep working on you with Jeremy Bentham. I'll turn you around on Bentham. Because, yeah, we'll have a lot of opportunities because he did quite a lot of writing about uh, criminal justice reform. Look, I, I, I don't hate Bentham that much. I hate John Stuart Mill if we're talking about utilitarianism a lot more because I have to teach way more of his writing. Okay, so maybe maybe this is not the philo- philosophical movement for you. Let's take the watchful eye of the prison guard out of the equation, and let's substitute instead the watchful eye of God. Uh, excuse me? Yes, it's time to talk about the Quakers. Oh, God. wait, the Quakers ran prisons? That I didn't know. Well, the Quakers did not run prisons. The Quakers were very involved in the prison reform movement uh, because uh, their founder, George Fox, actually was incarcerated in 1651. Possible future episode, actually. Um, The Quakers are a really interesting religious movement. He gets a very up close and personal view of both the very sorry state of British prisons in the 1600s and the cruel excesses of the bloody code. And the Quakers, I mean, even even hundreds of years later, still carry that forward. They go in hard on prison reform. They are involved in a ton of not just prison reform, uh, but larger criminal justice reform movements. One of the most famous prison reformers in uh, England is a woman named Elizabeth Fry, who is a Quaker who is particularly famous for her work in women's prisons. Now, uh, I mentioned that Jeremy Bentham thought that prisoners ought to engage in productive labor, both to pay off their debts to individuals in society, and because he thought that productive labor was something that was going to be improving to the human character. Elizabeth Fry actually does think this as well. Uh, She spends a lot of her time specifically involved in prison reform, teaching prisoners how to knit, spin, and sew so that when they leave prison, they can have some useful life skills. And this is a very fine idea. Fry is still remembered well for her work today. I do want to point out that at the time in the Industrial Revolution, when she was doing a lot of this work, some of these skills were not necessarily obsolete, but I would say not as great a way to earn a living as they had been in the pre-industrial era. Maybe it's time to teach women something uh, slightly more practical and up to date, but she did try. She tried very hard. And uh, she was particularly involved in movements to separate out female prisoners. Uh, So to take female prisoners out of these general population prisons where a lot of them faced some 
pretty horrific abuse and to put them and specifically their children who were still imprisoned with them into these separate situations so they could learn how to do productive work without the distractions and uh, without the trauma of this horrifying general population prison environment. I mean, yeah, you know, fair enough. Fair enough. It is now also occurring to me that I'd be very curious to know, like, when people stopped having to raise children in prison. I imagine the history of uh, that those, like, child welfare laws is probably interesting, but also very depressing. Yeah, I didn't go super deep into that because I thought it would be extremely depressing and uh, difficult to joke about in a humor-based podcast. Um, But yeah, that is something that reformers obviously eventually did get around to tackling, as you may have noticed that there are not children in British prisons today. But when you take all of these criminals and you hand them a bunch of sharp needles, how are you going to make sure that they stay on their best behavior while they're learning these practical life skills? Well, you read scripture at them. So while they are doing all this fiber work, they will also be improving their moral fiber. And this is intended to not get them to kill you? Yes. This is intended to improve their character. Remember, again, these are Quakers. They, their hearts are in the right place. Sometimes their ideas are very Bible-focused. God bless some very kind people. Uh, don't know about that one, buddy. During their off hours, while they are not learning to do productive work, you teach the prisoners and their children to read the Bible so that they can spend even more time in their off hours learning all about the good word. God, I mean, I like, I know that objectively all of this is better than what came before. And I'm sure that if you're in that scenario and you're aware of that, you're like, okay, this could be worse. But also... That sounds so insufferable. (laughs) Yeah, the Quakers, I do not want to put the Quakers down too much. They were hugely, hugely involved in organizing movements to end some really horrific uh, laws and really horrific things happening within prisons during this period. Um, But their kind of go-to standby of what to replace things with tended to be Bible, just Bible, replace it with the Bible. And I should say the Quakers were not the only religious folks involved in this. Um, A lot of prisons had chaplains who would have been Anglican as well. Um, Other religious movements are involved as well. It isn't exclusively a Quaker thing. Uh, They just come up a lot specifically in prison reform because of the history of their own religion and their their organization of a lot of these movements. Uh, But... Reading the Bible at people is all well and good. And teaching people how to read the Bible is all well and good. But uh, what if your prisoners need some time to themselves to really contemplate how great God is? What if you put them somewhere solitary where they could really, really think about how much they Did the Quakers invent solitary confinement? Uh, They did not invent it. Fry herself was not particularly keen on it um especially she did not believe it should be she didn't think it should be a punishment for prisoners but a lot of people who are in this particular branch of the reform movement are big on the idea and there's sort of a there's sort of a belief among some of them that like especially when you look back in english history and you look at those old monastic orders who were isolating themselves the idea of like the the way to become as close to God as you can possibly be is to live in isolation. If you put yourselves in the shoes of these people and you think, again, remember that description of Newgate prison, how crowded and stinky and bug infested and disgusting it is. Think about going into a prison like that and saying, wouldn't it be better if these people were separated out? And again, like I said, with a lot of Elizabeth Fry's work separating out men and women, some of that separation we still consider necessary in prisons today. However, some people take that even further and say, what if we separate all prisoners from everybody? So Pentonville Prison, like I said, the one that gets kind of inspired by that idea of a central area and radiating spokes from the panopticon, although it's not really a true panopticon, 
it is uh, a model prison that is built to sort of model a bunch of these new reform ideas. It opens in 1842, and it is an attempt to take the idea of solitary confinement for the betterment of human nature to an extreme. So instead of being crammed into one big space with many other prisoners, each man imprisoned in Pentonville gets kept in his own cell for as many as 18 months, totally alone. His only visitors during this whole time are the chaplain and other prison officials. He is supposed to have no contact whatsoever with the other prisoners that he's imprisoned with. When he's allowed out to religious services or even to exercise in the yard, uh, the spaces are designed to keep each man separate from each other. And also these prisoners can get punished for talking to each other, even in situations where they might be right next to each other. When prisoners get led through the common area, their faces will be hidden from the other prisoners by masks. So it's an attempt to keep people as solitary as possible from other prisoners so that they can spend the most time possible engaged in quiet contemplation. And the, this, is, this is how they're going to improve their moral character. Uh, this is how they are going to get turned into axe murderers, I'm pretty sure. So Pentonville Prison isn't the only one that tries this, although it is one of the ones that is specifically built to do this. Uh, other pris prisons like Gloucester and Cold Bath Fields penitentiaries aren't built for specifically solitary confinement, but they use it as punishment. So Pendenville is using it as the sort of the main concept of the prison. Other prisons are using it as punishment. And some other institutions like Magdalen Hospital also attempted to reform people who weren't even prisoners, um, like sex workers who didn't want to be sex workers anymore. The idea of the penitent prostitute, they would also end up in solitary confinement. So this is part of a larger a larger movement towards quiet contemplation in order to reform your character. Um, and like you said, it turns out putting people in solitary confinement is uh, not great for the human brain. It is still legal in some cases in Britain today. Uh, it's also legal in America, uh, which by some counts puts up to a quarter million inmates in solitary confinement for some period of time every year. I'm going to say it probably shouldn't be. At least there should be way more restrictions on the use of solitary confinement than there actually are in practice. Because inmates in solitary confinement can end up with disturbed sleep patterns caused by the fact that they aren't their circadian their circadian rhythms get really messed up because they're kept away from the sun and they basically don't have a normal sort of biological cues of when to wake and when to sleep. Um, they can end up with psychosis being triggered by disturbed sleep and ongoing sensory deprivation. And they can end up with other functional difficulties and mental illness caused by being kept in a situation where they have no contact with other people and no control over their environment. It's just a really, really bad thing to do to people. It doesn't reform their moral character, but it does change them. It just does not change them for the better. It changes people for the worse and sometimes permanently for the worse. Being released from solitary confinement does not make the effects of solitary confinement go away. Um, the issues that it causes can persist for a very long time. Yeah, my understanding is that in the U.S. at least it's mostly used in a very punitive way, uh, which certainly I guess it makes more sense in a dark sort of way than trying to reform people's character with it. Um, but seems very cruel. Put it very, that way. very cruel. It is, it is in the sense that reformers were trying to get rid of corporal punishment, aka basically physically punishing people, torturing them. It was successful on that front. However, we now understand that it is a form of psychological torture. Um, and of course, the kinds of prisoners who get sent to solitary confinement very frequently are likely to be the ones with behavior issues that may be caused by an underlying mental disorder to begin with. So just on the whole, it sucks. It, it's not doing what it was intended to do, and it's not a good thing to do to people, and it doesn't make people better people. So yeah, like I said, America still does use solitary confinement as punishment 
Britain does use solitary confinement as punishment. Pretty quickly, Britain, however, does cotton on to the fact that solitary confinement is not morally reforming its prisoners. Um, so that experiment doesn't last terribly long. So what do you do with prisoners if you can't make them behave by keeping an eye on them, reading scripture at them, or keeping them isolated? Well, a little light knitting is one thing, but what if you gave them harder work to do? Really hard work. What about reforming someone's moral character through hard labor? Uh, we're back to transportation, but without the logistical issues. Yep, we are back to prison labor. So the idea of putting convicts to work is obviously not new. Uh, the fact that England had to stop shipping off all of its convicts to work overseas is part of what necessitates some of this prison reform in the first place. And the British prisons that did exist in the 16 and 1700s very much did have their convicts doing hard labor. But during this period of reform, the kind of hard labor that they do shifts. And the way people talk about prisoners working does shift a bit. It's not quite as politic to say, I think we should ship our criminals off to work on plantations because it's awfully convenient for me, a rich politician who owns plantations. You have to pitch the hard labor as something that is good for the prisoners, not just something that is benefiting the people who are getting the results of that free labor. So the pitch then becomes, oh, it's 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 uh, in the same way that when my students complain about their homework, I'm like, it builds character when mm -hmm. they complain about being forced to do hard labor, it builds character. Yeah. So all the way back in 1779, the Penitentiary Act, which is actually what proposes two brand new institutions for housing prisoners, is uh, starting to think about using hard labor as a form of punishment and also reform in itself. And it specifies the kind of labor that prisoners should be doing. It's, quote, the hardest and most servile kind in which drudgery is chiefly required. What? So what does that mean in practice, that drudgery is chiefly required? So it's not just that prisoners are producing something. They want it to be very unpleasant work to do, um, work that is itself a form of punishment, but also a form of reform because you're uh, – you are, the, the idea is that you're sort of morally shaping people through drudgery, that through, through the process of doing work instead of being idlers, they become better people. So a really common form of hard labor was something called picking oakum. Oakum is a kind of hemp fiber that's mixed with tar. It's used for caulking seams on wooden boats and sealing water pipes. And during this time period, what does Victorian England have a lot of? It's got a lot of wooden boats, it's got a lot of water pipes, needs a lot of oakum. So you can make oakum out of regular old hemp, just processing it normally into fiber and then kind of loosely spinning the fiber. But if you want to save a buck, there's another way to make oakum, which is picking apart old frayed hemp ropes to get those component hemp fibers back that you can then recycle by spinning into oakum. Oh, how environmentally conscious. How environmentally cautious and how cheap if you don't have labor costs to worry about. Picking oakum was actually something that, uh, something that sailors in the British Navy would get assigned as a punishment because it sucks. It super sucks to do this. Picking like a pound of it will cut up your hands so badly that they are bleeding in the short term in the longer term they get covered with these black scars in the Ooh. very long term they can cause repetitive stress injuries so this isn't just like you're sort of unraveling ropes all day and it's boring but you're you know you're contemplating the bible while you do it you are physically tearing up your hands to the point that they're bleeding and scarring so that is one thing that prisoners can do that is at least in theory productive. But if there is no productive work to be found for your prisoners, that doesn't mean that they're allowed to stop working. So prisons actually start building machines that the prisoners have to work. In some cases, uh, they have to 
Basically, uh, some prisons would put these cranks inside someone's prison cell and the crank would lead to a paddles that were just in a box of sand. So it was very hard to turn. And prisoners would just have to keep cranking these all day long in order to get food. So absolutely no productive work is happening here. It is just the act of getting people to work that is important. I feel like the very tenuous logic of like hard labor improves character has been abandoned altogether at this point. Yeah, again, as much as you are low to admit it, Jeremy Bentham did start out with an idea that kind of made sense about prisoners being able to see at least some, you know, benefit of their labor. I rag on Bentham as much as I rag on any philosopher, but I give him credit he thought the idea through on paper, which I don't think just have him paddle some sand. Like, I don't I don't think anyone stopped to think about how that's supposed to connect back to the core notion here. Yeah, it gets turned into this idea of just making people do labor is good. Like making people do the labor is part of the reform process. Um, so that is just a bunch of prisoners just get assigned like completely useless tasks. I think some of them would also be given cannonballs and just you had to do squats with a cannonball for a really long time. Like things like that. Just get the core shredded. Yeah. For a couple of for a couple of reps. Sure. That's like a, a great new kettlebell exercise. But like doing it all day as a lot of them had to do was extremely physically punishing. And uh, speaking of trendy exercises, there's also a very early form of the treadmill, the prison treadmill. So what happens in a prison treadmill is that you hold onto a bar and you're walking on a wheel, which is sort of a simple version of our modern treadmill. So you're you're propelling a machine. And, and some of these prison tre treadmills actually were hooked up to machines that did something in the prison, um, but a lot of them, like a lot of the reason for using these prison treadmills was just getting the prisoners to do labor. You could write such a masturbatory New York Times op-ed about like a good chunk of modern CrossFit being originally part of prison punishment routines. Like I, it's not quite coming together in my head, but I feel like the core pitch is there. And yeah. I, I don't know. If you're in the New York Times op-ed board, you're welcome for that idea. Well, CrossFit is pretty lazy compared to what these prisoners were doing. They would do this for 10 minutes at a time and then get a five-minute break for eight hours a day. An entire workday of doing this. Wow, that sounds truly horrific. I don't even have a joke about that. Yeah, they they were climbing the equivalent of about 8,000 feet daily doing this. And uh, all of this labor that they're putting in this so-called productive labor, um, one pound of coal can produce the equivalent of the labor of five men. So like their entire, eight, like five men, eight hours a day doing this, one pound of coal could have powered the same machines. So in a sense, they are productive in the, in, in the sense that the treadmill does something, but it's not productive labor in the sense that they are producing a product that they can be proud of and learn to take pride in their work. This is just punish this is just punishment and arguably torture. Man, yeah, that's grim. I re I got nothing. I really got nothing. And keep in mind a lot of this is happening at Pentonville, that model prison that I talked about. So, uh the, the folks at Pendenville were getting it from all sides. They could be in solitary confinement and also doing hard labor and also in this weirdly built prison designed to give guards more oversight of their behavior than ever before. So they got full blast all the prison reform at once. And let me tell you, it was not very reformative for a lot of them. It was just a weird form of torture. Yeah, I mean, I imagine there were quite a few who are like, is Australia still an option? So I do have some good news for you, and not just about Australia, which I'm told is a lovely place to visit these days. I'd rather go to New Zealand. I really like the uh, Lord of the Rings movies. 
Well, my good news for you is that some prison reforms, not these specifically, but some of them actually did work. I do want to highlight some of the things that English reformers tried out in this period that did make a difference in the way that we treat prisoners even today. One of the most basic things that we don't even think about because it's taken completely for granted is fresh air and general cleanliness. Because British prisons pre-reform didn't just have a problem with nasty bugs and smells. They had really terrible problems with something called jail fever. Overcrowded and filthy conditions in prison meant that diseases spread fast and were often deadly to physically weak prisoners. So just saying, hey, maybe we should build prisons so that like the prison yard is bigger, prisoners get more exercise, and that pris prisoners get a chance to do things like bathe on occasion, maybe that's good for them. I mean, yeah, you know, good call, good shout on that one. And while the idea of simple fare got taken to some weird extremes by people who thought that tasty spices would corrupt the brain and body, the idea of feeding prisoners good and nutritious food actually was very necessary reform for keeping prisoners alive and healthy, especially the ones who were doing all of this hard labor. Yeah. So this is definitely a period where they, they start saying like, hey, if we're making these guys do incredibly difficult labor for eight hours a day, maybe we should make sure that they have some bread to eat. I mean, and to be fair, like, I just assume that being afraid of spice in general is just a hallmark of English cooking. Yeah, this is, again, this this isn't necessarily intended as a punishment. This was people thinking it was more healthy not to eat spices. <laughs> Reformers also got interested in separating out prisoner populations by the seriousness of their offenses. So uh, you weren't throwing petty thieves in with violent murderers anymore. This is still something that carries on to prisons to this day. And as I mentioned, with Elizabeth Fry's work with female prisoners in particular, separating prisoners out by sex cut down on a lot of sexual abuse of women in prisons, although it didn't eliminate it completely. And while Fry and other Quakers' education work was very Bible-centric, and we did drag on that in this episode, the idea of teaching prisoners to read, hell, the idea of teaching them at all, turned out to be a really good one. And teaching them some practical job skills ended up not being a terrible idea either, even if Fry's ideas for a practical job for a woman could be a bit narrow by modern standards. Yeah, and I mean, if you teach them to read, think of all the things they can read that aren't the Bible. There's so many exciting options out there. Yeah, prison libraries are still very much a thing to this day. Um, and a lot of prisoners actually do complete uh, degrees while in prison. It is actually something that is hugely useful in, in reducing recidivism. If you give people a path towards employment and towards steady work, a lot of people will take that. And uh, also on the subject of making sure that your convicts got plenty of Bible time, an attempt to connect drunkards with missionaries to reform them instead of keeping them in prison evolves into the modern British probation system. So saying, hey, instead of just bunging everyone in prison for a set period of time and then letting them out, what if we had a system where we didn't even put people in prison or we put them in prison for shorter amounts of time, and then we just sort of kept track of them and saw how they were doing and, and saw if maybe they could continue with some supervision, not the supervision of a guard in a weird circular building, but some supervision live a better life. And uh, prison reformers also advocated for treating prisoners equally and not charging them fees for food or other privileges in prison. So no more of that Newgate system where you pay for better digs and better food. Everybody gets the same stuff and that stuff should be of decent quality. I personally think this is a good idea. I will also say we have backslid on this quite a lot in America. Uh, prisoners actually can be charged quite a lot of money, not just for stuff like commissary items, so special, you know, like snacks and stuff like that. A lot of people in American prisons today have to pay for privileges, like being able to call their own families. Um, I think that sucks. Yeah, I mean, I I, don't know, I have a whole rant I'm saving up for the end here, but like... If you want people to be better 
I do think treating them not like complete shit is probably a good place to start. Okay, so okay, let's get into this. Let's talk about people being better because a lot of what is underpinning this uh, prison reform is the belief in moral character, not necessarily a moral character you're born with, but a moral character that is the source of your good and bad behavior. And I feel like we today have moved away from talking about moral character as something inherent, and especially talking about moral character when we talk about crime. We are much more likely today to talk about these social and economic circumstances that feed into criminal activity. It, are you asking my opinion on this question? So, yeah, what do you have to say about that? Oh, God. Um, well, despite being in suf- an even more insufferable prick than anyone else we've talked about in this episode, I do think Immanuel Kant was right that ultimately you can't be responsible for other people's moral choices, and ultimately each individual is only responsible for their own choices. Like, you can't make someone do something they don't want to do unless you hold a gun to their head, in which case they're just going to stop doing it the moment you take the gun away. You, like, you can't make someone change who doesn't want to change. Um, I agree that, to an extent, uh, people, because they are the product of their social conditions, like you should keep that in mind when you judge their actions. I do think some people take that too far and say that therefore people who do bad things coming out of bad circumstances are somehow like blameless for that. Um, That seems like a view that ends in the abandonment of any ability to make a moral judgment at all, because we are all products of our circumstances. This is actually a key insight of some early Buddhist moral philosophy that essentially says you can't hold anyone to account for anything because all of us are products of cause and effect that we don't control and therefore like aren't fully responsible for our own actions. And I think that's a pile of shit. Um, Like you do still have a choice ultimately in any circumstance. Maybe it's not a good choice or one that doesn't end particularly nicely for you, but you do always have a choice and you have a responsibility about how you use that choice. Um, so in the classic philosophical cop-out answer, I would say I'm somewhere in the middle on that one. Some people, if they genuinely show a desire to be reformed or to change, I think should be helped in that process. But I don't think it's necessarily the case that you can make everyone do that. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so, uh, all right, put yourself in the shoes of these prison reformers. You are trying to make a system in which you turn out, turn people out of a prison better than they entered it. What, what are you, what are you going to tackle here? What, what angle are you going to come at this from? I mean, one of the things I've been kind of thinking about over the course of this episode is that I feel like we, we as a like civilization kind of clocked the answer to this one, like a solid two millennia ago, like going back to the Greek city States if you want people to buy into the system, you give them a stake in the system. Like, if they have something to lose, they will not want to lose the thing. So if you give them, like, if you give people the opportunity to do things like get an education, right, while they're in prison, or, you know, learn an actually useful job skill, not just picking apart, like, uh, fibers to make oakum, like, then... Some of them, at least, I think, you know, will buy in because they now realize, oh, I have something I like I could gain from this system and could lose as a part of this system. Like and therefore, I'm you know hesitant to continue offending against it. Um, I think there's some logic there. Again, not everyone's going to buy into it. And the question becomes, of course, what do you do then? And that I don't have a good answer for. Um, Interesting. OK, so you, you think that. That convicts should have agency in in even in the prison system and that they should share in some of the profits of their labor. I mean, I think you have to like if you offer people a benefit from their labor and you show them like, hey, you know, this is the path of least resistance essentially for you is to be like a pro social member of society and kind of engage with the system. Yeah, you know, I'm not a fully an economist who believes everyone always acts in their rational self-interest, 
but humans are rational enough. I think a decent chunk will take you up on that. And as these folks are in prison, acting or not acting in their self-interest, uh, how are you going to keep an eye on them? Uh, I mean, obviously, by telling our listeners that if we hit the top, like the top subscribed, like uh, offer on Patreon overall, uh, then one of our crowdfunding goals should be to open our own Panopticon. <laughs> Just to prove once and for yeah, all yeah. whether or not it works. You are sounding a lot more like Jeremy Bentham than you are. I, and I do, like Bro. I don't hate him any more than I hate any other philosopher. I just hate all of them as a collective because they're deeply insufferable. All right, and with that, philosophy teacher, should we end it here? I think that's perfect. And uh, do we want to stand by that pronouncement that if we become the most popular Patreon in existence? One of our crowdfunding goals will be to open a uh, open our own Panopticon. You know what? If Mr. Beast is running Squid Games, uh, the, yeah, I think the people the people long for wild uh, theoretical punishments enacted on real human beings. All right, you heard it now. Don't donate and subscribe. Mash that like button or whatever. And uh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Sorry. And while you contemplate um, the the notion of a crowdfunded prison, uh, remember that you can always get in touch with us at our website, uh, facingbackward.com. Uh, also, of course, you can always find us on Patreon uh, and donate to get us one step closer to building our own Panopticon. Do we brand that? Is it the Facing Backward Panopticon? A much more famous podcast than us has already claimed the Panopticon. I'm sorry to tell you. Uh. Can a stretch goal be at least that we get Jeremy Bentham's head and put it in the middle of the thing? I would actually love to make Jeremy Bentham's head uh, one of the one of the new emblems of our podcast. Perfect. Love it. Uh, so, you know, go to Patreon. Give us your thoughts on that. Uh, join the fine folks who have paid to be a part of our Patreon shout out tier, who are Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker. Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Kat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, and Anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongo Kaizen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Yaponizia podcast, Jennifer Pionzio, James, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are Rhodes Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. I'm sure all of these people are now either like, oh, this is great, or I'm really regretting signing up to support these people. <laughs> Look at the hubris you've enabled. As podcasters, I don't think we can say that people should spend their time in silent contemplation. Yeah, silently contemplate how awesome it would be for us to build our own Panopticon. <laughs> I'll get you on Jeremy Bentham. I will get you. Mm -hmm.